right. And in lecture, we ended off talking about the last, last part of the large intestine, what's happening in the large intestine, and how we get rid of any of the undigested material through defecation. Now, the rest of this lecture is mostly talking about what actually is breaking down or how the different chemicals are getting broken down and how they get absorbed. So we're going to look at chemical digestion, so the actual breaking down of these different things we eat. Now, digestion itself is a catabolic reaction. Now, if you remember way back when, cats break things, so we are breaking things down from macromolecules, large things, to smaller molecules or singular molecules into monomers. We need to break things down into small enough pieces that we can actually absorb them. Now, we have lots and lots of enzymes that we use to help break this down. We've got intrinsic and accessory gland enzymes that are breaking all the food down. Now, what the enzymes try to do is they do what's known as hydrolysis. With their enzymes, they are using the enzymes and they are adding water to different molecules and the water will break apart the bonds. And so we're breaking large molecules down into small molecules. Now, as we go through the digestion of different types of chemicals, I'm going to keep referring in your book to page 893. Now, it wouldn't be a bad idea, since I'm going to keep referring to it and I'll have little snippets kind of cut out from that one particular diagram on page 893. You may want to pause me, and if you have your book handy, find page 893. And so we're going to start with digestion of carbohydrates. Now, carbohydrates, we have to break it down all the way to monosaccharides. Now, the word monosaccharide means single or one sugar. Carbohydrates are made up of sugar molecules. We need to break it all the way down to the simplest single individual sugar molecules. Now, sugar molecules that we can absorb, monosaccharides, such as glucose, fructose, and galactose. So we have to break all of our big complex sugars down into these basic sugars so that we can absorb them. Now there are different enzymes that start helping breaking down carbohydrates. Salivary amylase found in our saliva, pancreatic amylase coming from our pancreas, and brush border enzymes. So these are enzymes that are found in the microvilli in our small intestine. Now what they are, with all of these enzymes, they are going to try to break down your sugars. We're going to try to break down disaccharides, which just means double sugar like sucrose, lactose, and maltose and we're going to try to break down large sugar molecules like glycogen and starch, which are going to be a little more complicated and are going to take a little bit more work to break it down. The carbohydrate we can't break down because it's so complex is cellulose, that's a fiber. Our bacteria try, but our enzymes cannot break down that complex carbohydrate. So starch digestion, the breaking down of this more complex polysaccharide, starts in the mouth. It starts with our sal salivary amylase and it's going to break down the starch into oligosaccharides. These are, as I say, larger, it's kind of like a multiple sugar unit. Not as big, not as complex as starch, but it's slowly starting to break it down. Now, it will break it down at a, about a neutral pH. Our saliva is about a neutral pH. Pancreatic amylases that get, you know, put into the small intestine and the duodenum will break down any starches that escaped your salivary amylase, also breaking them down into those oligosaccharides, those larger sugars, but not as large as the starch itself. And then our brush border enzymes. So these are again found in your microvilli, in your small intestine. We've got a whole bunch of enzymes. Dextrinase, glucamylase, lactase, maltase, and sucrase. They're meant purposely is to take their specific sugars and break them down into monosaccharides. So dextrinase will break down dextrose, lactase breaks down lactose, and so on. And it will break down larger sugars, including oligosaccharides, these larger sugar units, into their individual monosaccharides for absorption. So again, page 893, where we have our breakdown of the carbohydrates, salivary amylase starts to break down starches, pancreatic amylase starts breaking down starches, and then those brush border enzymes from our brush border cells and our microvilli is trying to break down those larger sugar units into our basic monosaccharides for absorption. Now, breaking down proteins. Now, where we get our proteins from, dietary, we're eating proteins in our diet. Digestive enzymes, if you remember, enzymes are proteins, and yes, they're used to break things down, but we also have to break them down as well. And then mucosal cells. 
the fact that our mucosal cells are constantly sloughing off because they're replacing themselves when they get sloughed off and I'm like they are giving off protein as we you know like that we need to break down now where protein breakdown begins is in the stomach with the enzyme pre pepsin now pepsin it's an enzyme that doesn't end in ace they almost all do but not all pepsin is an enzyme that breaks down proteins but for pepsin to work it needs to be at a really low pH around two which is great because that's what the stomach acid pH so we find pepsin in the stomach and it starts to break down proteins other protein enzymes that are going to start breaking down proteins we have our pancreatic proteases again enzymes that day break down proteins coming from the pancreas there's trypsin chemotrypsin and carboxypeptidase these are all going to break down proteins down into their single individual amino acids because amino acids strung together make proteins and so these enzymes are going to break them down and then we also have more enzymes from those brush border cells in the microvilli. We have aminopeptidases, carboxypeptidases, and dipeptidases. Now, what these particular enzymes do is we are breaking down proteins into their basic amino acids using pepsin and proteases. So we've got amino acids. But what these brush border enzymes do is they actually break up the amino acid as well. So they're going to break off carboxy groups. If you remember an amino acid, it has a central carbon, it has four things. There's an H, a single hydrogen, there's a carboxyl group, amino group, and your R group or your variable group. Well, the amino peptidase is gonna break off the amino group. The carboxy peptidase is gonna break off the carboxyl group. And the dipeptidase just breaks apart two amino acids. In case, in the process of breaking apart proteins, they weren't broken down into individual amino acids, they were still in pairs. And so we've got more enzymes further breaking things down. Now, trypsin does not need, I was going to say, trypsin and your pancreatic proteases do not need the low pH. They would prefer more of a closer to a neutral pH, and I'm like, or even a, you know, slightly alkaline, as is a lot of the fluids that are coming from the pancreas. So pepsin requires that low pH found in the stomach. The other enzymes don't. They would prefer more of a higher pH or a neutral pH. Now, again, page 893, where we have proteins getting broken down. Yes, the uh, starts in the stomach. So no proteins are broken down until the stomach. Then you have pepsin that need that low pH. We've got our pancreatic enzymes, and then we've got those brush border enzymes further breaking all of our proteins down. Now, digestion of lipids gets a little trickier because we have to first pre-treat them with, those, with that bile, with those bile salts. And if you remember, the bile salts don't actually break apart the lipids. They don't break apart the fat. They emulsify it. They just make it so they're not as attracted to each other anymore. They don't break them off. They just make it so they're not as attracted to each other anymore, which then becomes more, you know, easier to break up when we start getting into actual enzymes. No, uh, one of the big enzymes that helps break apart lipids is lipase which comes from the pancreas, lots of enzymes from the pancreas. And it will break down these lipids into fatty acids and monoglycerides. These are smaller molecules that we can start to absorb. And so we're gonna start to absorb some of these molecules like glycerol and fatty acids in the villi, in the small intestine, into the capillary blood. So we're gonna go straight from the small intestine into the blood supply. And then those glycerol and fatty acid components are gonna go to the liver and like they're going to either get stored or they're going to get switched to something else and I'm like or we're going to uh, use them so we just have to break them up or emulsify not break them and I'm like emulsify them so they don't like each other very much then use lipases um, to further break down the lipids this is just looking here's a big fat globule it likes itself it likes to stay together as a big fat globule bile salts that come from bile put into the small intestine into the duodenum We'll make it so that fat doesn't like to hang out by itself as one big piece anymore. And so the bile salts kind of separate <coughs> that fat globule. They just don't like each other. The fat globule starts to kind of break apart. It just doesn't like each other. And then, yes, then we'll start to get some of our lipases that are going to break it down even to smaller pieces. Going to break down the fat with your bile salts, break it into smaller pieces, into your fatty acids monoglycerides and 
um, you'll still have some bile salts. Those will get absorbed. So those can get absorbed and eventually make it into the blood supply. So breaking down, down of lipids. Now, the big part, we do have lingual lipase. We do have uh, lipid breaking down enzyme in our saliva. We also have some in our gastric juices. These can start to break down lipids, but they're not gonna break down a lot because it's not until you can first start with that emulsification using the bile salts that you really get a good effective breaking down of bile. This will start and it will start to break it down, but generally you need to emulsify it first. Then using your pancreatic lipases, you can really more effectively break down your fats. Now, digestion of nuclei, the nucleic acids. Yes, the nucleic acids is the NA of DNA. And then people are like, we eat DNA? You bet, everything that's ever alive, plant or animal, all the cells in it is DNA. Which means if we are eating plants and animals, because we are, we are also eating the DNA from those plants and animals. So it's one other molecule we have to break down. So again, we have enzymes coming from the pancreas, lots and lots of enzymes from the pancreas. We have a pancreatic ribonuclease that's gonna help break down your RNA. And you're gonna have deoxyribonuclease, which helps break down DNA into the nucleotide monomers where you have your sugar phosphate and your nitrogen base. We also have brush border enzymes, again, more enzymes from those brush border cells in your microvilli, uh, called nucleosidases and phosphatases that help break apart those nucleotide monomers that break off the nucleic part, you know, break off the base, they're gonna break off the phosphate, and so now you have bases, you have sugar, and you have phosphate ions, all of which can get absorbed. Again, page 893, so nothing breaking down of your nucleic acids happens until you can get into that small intestine and you've got secretions from your pancreas and you have the enzymes coming from those brush border cells. Now, we've broken everything down. We've broken down lipids, carbohydrates, proteins, and nucleic acids. Now we have to absorb them all. So we broke them down, but we have to absorb them. Now, about almost all your food but 80% of your electrolytes and most of your water is absorbed in the small intestine. Now, most of that even happens before it even gets to the ileum. So really, the jejunum is doing a lot because the duodenum's not all that big. Duodenum helps break things down, but most absorption takes place in the jejunum. The ileum starts to reclaim some of the bile salts that were used to help break apart and emulsify the fats. And so we kind of try to, we try to recycle if we can. Now, most of our thing, you know, most of our basic mono uh, units, whether it's the monosaccharides or amino acids, most of them are absorbed by active transport into the blood. Now, active transport requires ATP. So it's gonna require energy to get to those molecules from our intestines into our body to be used. An exception, lipids. Lipids passively can go through. We concentrate them enough in the intestine, they passively wanna go through. So we're gonna go in the same order we did before. We digested all of these, now we're gonna absorb them. So we're gonna start with absorbing of carbohydrates. So we broke it down into the most basic sugars, glucose, galactose, and fructose. They get absorbed a little different though. Glucose and galactose get absorbed through what's known as uh, secondary active transport or co-transport with sodium ions into our epithelial cells. Meaning as we pump sodium from our digestive system, from our small intestine, and actively using ATP pump that sodium into the epithelial cells, glucose and galactose pair up with the sodium and kind of tag along and go with. So they're co-transported. They're kind of little tag alongs. Then they'll move out of the, you know, then they're gonna move out of those epithelial cells by facilitated diffusion and into the capillary beds. Again, into your blood vessels. So then they're just gonna use, once they try to leave those epithelial cells, they're gonna use facilitated diffusion. It just means they need a carrier protein to move across membranes. Fructose doesn't do the co-transport. It doesn't need to move with sodium. It doesn't tag along with sodium. The fructose sugar, again, it's a monosaccharide, just uses facilitated diffusion. It just goes in and out of various uh, helper proteins to get in and out of the cells. Now, absorption of proteins. Again, we broke everything down to amino acids. And then we even tried to break some of those, those parts down. Now, amino acids are transported by several different types of carriers or carrier proteins. 
most are coupled with active transport or the active transport of sodium just like carbohydrates as we are actively pumping sodium across a cell some amino acids tag along with it dipeptides and tripeptides so we were able to break down proteins but there's still a chain of two or three amino acids together since they're a little bit larger we'd prefer to break them down farther but if they're a little bit larger we can still get some nutrients out of it and we absorbed these larger molecules by hydrogen ion depending co-transport so we pump across the hydrogen ions and then they tag along then eventually they will get broken down to their individual their single amino acids in the epithelial cells and eventually get into our blood supply by diffusion now my little note on absorbing proteins we again try to break down proteins to their basic amino acids and if we you know can't do that we at least try to get it to dipeptides and tripeptides where it's just two or three amino acids still way smaller than what it was if our bodies tried to absorb larger proteins or whole proteins our immune system would see them as foreign and it would mount an immune response this is how people end up with food allergies so if anyone that's listening right now has a food allergy a lot of food allergies are protein type foods like peanuts it's because I'm like for some reason we don't have some certain enzyme that can break those proteins down and our body is pumping those large proteins not fully broken down it's trying to pump them across the membrane and our body recognizes those big proteins as foreign and it mounts a full immune system now there are again food allergies that are not all proteins but a lot of your protein food allergies are because we're trying to pump, the, pump these too large of proteins across the membrane now we've got to absorb our lipids we broke them down absorb it now absorbing of lipids a little, little again a little trickier kind of already previewed a little bit with this diagram because we have to break it apart then it gets absorbed and so we're going to absorb your monoglycerides your individual tiny little glycerol and your fatty acids the first thing they do is they cluster with the bile salts and form these little things called micelles now these micelles are going to be released um, to go into the epithelial cells better wording they're going to be released and they're going to go into the epithelial cells they're going to i was going to say they're going to release just the fatty portion inside of it now once they get into the epithelial cell inside of the epithelial cell we have what are known as lacteals now this again is inside of the intestinal wall it's these lacteals is where we can actually get these small fatty portions to get absorbed in and so the fatty acids and the monoglycerols and I'm like they're gonna leave the micelles and they're gonna diffuse into the epithelial cells and eventually make it into these lacteals lacteals now yes our body will transport these around and depending on our need we're either gonna use them for energy or if we don't need them for energy we're gonna store them as fat and then our last the nucleic acids the fact that we yes eat DNA and we break it down it's absorbed by active transport we just pump those small little molecules the phosphate groups the bases the sugars we're just gonna pump them across the epithelium into bloodstream pretty easy but we've got a few other things we have to absorb too we have to absorb vitamins so they're not proteins they're not lipids and like they're their own molecule vitamins most absorption of vitamins takes place in the small intestine now there are fat soluble vitamins and there are water soluble vitamins fat soluble vitamins your a d e and k get carried by my cells and then diffuse into your absorb absorptive cells and so some of the vitamins have to get bundled into these my cells to eventually get absorbed this means if you take vitamins without eating any foods with fat in them you won't absorb those vitamins so you do need some amount of fat in your diet so if you have a diet and you're like I'm just gonna eat you know veggies all day long and you get absolutely no no fat no lipids whatsoever anywhere in your diet you're not gonna absorb vitamins A D E or K because those vitamins have to get paired up with those lipids and then get absorbed water soluble vitamins like vitamin C and B they can just be absorbed by diffusion or passive transport or active transporters there's lots of ways we can pump them across 
It's just those fat soluble vitamins get a little trickier. So it's not bad to have fat in your diet. And then vitamin B12, that unique one, it's the one that has to bind with the intrinsic factor to allow us to actually absorb it in. Now, again, most vitamins get absorbed in the small intestine, as most things do. However, the large intestine, if you remember, has some bacteria in there, and bacteria are not all bad, because some of the bacteria can actually make vitamins, like vitamin K and vitamin B. Now, since they're made in the large intestine, we can't ship these vitamins backwards because it's a one-way direction, and so they get absorbed in the large intestine. So a few get absorbed in the large intestine. Then we have to absorb electrolytes, all of these different ions. So most ions are absorbed actively just along the small intestine. And again, as we're pumping lots of sodium as one, it's usually coupled with glucose and amino acids too, but we're constantly pumping. Iron and calcium are absorbed in the duodenum, and that's the only place they get absorbed. They don't get absorbed in the jejunum or the ileum. They just, they're specifically, they get absorbed right away in the duodenum. Chloride gets transported actively, uses ATP to pump it across. Potassium diffuses in response to osmotic gradients. And so, and I'm like, if water is absorbed from the lumen, if we're absorbing lumen, you know, water out of the small intestine, out of where the food is, if water leaves, that means you're gonna have lots and lots of potassium, rising levels of potassium in the intestinal, inside the intestine. If you have lots of potassium inside the intestine, it will then leave as well. And so if your water absorption is poor, you're not gonna absorb as much potassium either. If you can't absorb water out, you're not gonna concentrate that potassium in your intestines and it won't wanna leave through diffusion. So they're tied together. And again, usually what is in the intestine for electrolytes is usually what is absorbed. We try to absorb just everything that's there. If you've got various ions in the small intestine, we try to absorb whatever's there. The however, the iron and the calcium, which are absorbed way up in the duodenum, they're only absorbed based on their need. And so we're only gonna absorb as much iron as we need and as much calcium as we need. Now, ionic iron is stored in, mucu is stored in mucosal cells with a protein called transferrin, or, like, or ferritin. And it's only when we need the iron. If we're low in iron, we need it for whatever reason, then it's going to get transported in the blood by something known as transferrin. Anything ferrous has to do with iron. So transferrin just means it's a transporter of iron. And again, it's only, you know, if we need it. And I'm like that we're going to absorb it and transport it where we need it. Calcium is regulated, if you remember from back when we did the skeletal system is regulated by vitamin D and the parathyroid hormone. Vitamin D is needed for calcium absorption, which is why if you ever looked at your milk container, vitamin, milk is fortified with vitamin D to help us absorb calcium. And then the parathyroid hormone, if you remember this as well, it releases calcium from bones if we don't have enough calcium in our blood supply, but it also stimulates the hormone calcitriol to absorb more calcium if we have a lot of calcium in our diet. So if you just got done eating or drinking something that had lots of calcium in it, that parathyroid hormone can tell the calcitriol hormone, hey, let's absorb that because we need it. Now, absorbing of water, nine liters of water, most from our GI tract secretions enters the small intestine. Again, remember, you've got saliva. You have gastric secretions, you have small intestine, your intestinal secretions, you've got pancreatic secretions. I'm like, you've got secretions everywhere. So nine liters of water, mostly from all the secretions, enters the small intestine. Most of it is absorbed in the small intestine by osmosis. Water wants to go where there's not as much water. Most of the rest then is absorbed in the large intestine. And so it leaves, you know, just a little bit, you know, water, not all of it, it's never 100%. It leaves just a little bit to be able to soften the feces, so it allows it to move through the intestine easier. Now, net osmosis occurs if, constant, if the concentration gradient is established by the active transport of solutes, meaning as we are actively pumping sodium ions, chloride ions, and again, amino acids and proteins will follow that sodium. As we are actively pumping solutes out 
of the intestinal wall, that means you have lots of water left in that intestine. Water doesn't want to be where there's lots of water. It wants to follow those solutes. So as we pump out solutes, water follows. So water uptake is always coupled with solute, solute uptake. Now, some things that can happen with absorbing of certain things. If you know anyone that's had this, it's the, your gluten sensitive. If you're a gluten sensitive, it's called gluten sensitive enteropathy, also known as celiac disease. It occurs in about one in every hundred people, and usually it's because you have some type of immune reaction to gluten, which is a protein. It is a protein found in all grains except corn and rice. So they can eat corn and rice just fine. Otherwise, that gluten protein, it tries to get absorbed, it's not broken down far enough, and it starts to cause immune cell damage to your intestinal villi and your brush border cells. Because again, as we try to absorb it, your immune system's like, we don't like this, let's go in, we start attacking, and it starts damaging the cells that are there. Now, if you start damaging your intestinal mucosa, it's not good, it can reduce some of your absorptive surface area, which means you can't absorb all the nutrients that you should. And if you start damaging your intestinal mucosa, other than not absorbing everything that you should, if you're damaging your mucosa, which is a barrier, you might start to have other bacterial infections. And so bacteria may be able to get in if that mucosal lining is damaged. So their easiest treatment is eliminate all of the gluten protein from your diet. So you can't eat any grains except corn or rice. Otherwise, if they do, you usually have diarrhea, you have pain, you have malnutrition. None of it's, none of it's great. And then a couple developmenting, developmental things that happen with our intestine. One, uh, fetal nutrition via, via the placenta. That yes, even before you were born, you get all your nutrients from your mom. However, that doesn't mean the digestive system isn't doing anything. A fetus is still actually swallowing amniotic fluid. And as they swallow amniotic fluid, it's stimulating their, their GI tract to, you know, receive things into it and what to do about it. And so there's, it helps them get their digestive tract going. Then there's a couple re reflexes in newborns. One, they have a rooting reflex, which helps them find a nipple. And then they have a sucking reflex that helps aid them in swallowing. So they want to be able to find and swallow and hold on. And I'm like, all inborn reflex. Now, the newborns double their birth weight in six months. And then even by two years old, they can have an adult diet. Whatever their parents eat, they can be eating as well. Now, for us, you know, based on what they eat, and I'm like, and all they're eating right away from birth to six months is they're drinking milk. They drink approximately 600 milliliters of milk a day, which would be equivalent to us drinking two and a half gallons a day. That's a lot of milk. And I'm like, but again, that's where they get all of their nutrients. Milk is mostly water-based. And so yes, this is also why you're changing diapers all day long. Because all they do is eat and pee and poop and that's their entire job because they want to double birth weight in their first six months. Now, some things as we get older. And I'm like, done with babies. As we start to get older, middle-age-ish, people start to get cholecystitis, aka gallbladder. You know, they start to get infections of the gallbladder, they might start to get gallstones, and they may start to get ulcers. So it increases with with age. As you start to get middle age, you have a higher risk of these. During old age, as you start to get older, your digestive tract activity declines. It's smooth muscle. It gets a little lazy. You have less digestive juices. The absorbing of nutrients is less efficient your peristalsis is slower, so it doesn't move food through as fast as it should. That leaves you with less frequent bowel movements. Now, problem with that, and if you have less frequent bowel movements, that means the feces that's there is staying there too long, and too much water gets absorbed. The more water that gets absorbed out while it's sitting there, it will compact the feces, and you have a higher chance of constipation. Some other things. One, your taste and smell is less acute. And I'm like, so, you know, you might not have, be as sensitive to what you're eating. And any type of periodontal or any type of teeth diseases can occur. 
You also have an increased chance of diver diverticulosis. That's when you're not eating enough fire and your um, fiber and your colon starts to contract with too much pressure. You start to get those little bulges in your sigmoid colon. You can get fecal incontinence, that external anal sphincter you may not be able to control anymore. You always have an increased chance of cancers as you get older, stomach cancers and colon cancers. Again, and I'm like, they're two common cancers, especially colon cancers. Problem with those two, colon cancers and stomach cancers are usually diagnosed too late. Usually by the time you have symptoms that something's going on, it's because it has actually started to spread to other organs. And so usually for those, if it runs in the family or they may just start, you know, having you at increased risk, getting a colonoscopy, um, checking for any abnormalities. Um, and I'm like, and just to try to prevent it. Because again, a lot of them are preventable or treatable if you catch them early. All right, on to the last, last of the review questions. In terms of gastrointestinal function, the large intestine's greatest contribution is, doesn't mean it doesn't do some of these, but it is the absorption of water. And I'm like, it will take any of the remaining water out. Pretty much all your nutrients, um, gastric motility and pancreatic enzymes, that's all small intestine. So out of these three, absorb water. It absorbs electrolytes as well. And then which of the following enzymes breaks down lipids? None of them do. Amylases break down carbohydrates. Pepsin breaks down protein. Bile doesn't break down lipids. It emulsifies it. It just makes it so they don't like each other. Lipases. Lipases are the enzymes that actually break down lipids. And there is the end.